there's a lot of research out there that really supports this conclusion that naming our emotions or affect labeling is good for us, that it helps us to reduce the intensity of that emotion and just helps us to have better well-being. However, surprise, I have a contender. A contender enters the ring. I did find a study that essentially says, that's all bullshit. Welcome to the Multi-Amory Podcast. I'm Jace. I'm Emily. And I'm Dedeker. We believe in looking to the future of relationships, not maintaining the status quo of the past. So whether you're monogamous, polyamorous, swinging, casually dating, or if you just do relationships differently, we see you and we're here for you. On this episode of the Multi Amory Podcast, we're talking about transforming your feelings into words. Putting one's emotions into words seems to be this highly prized skill. It's the basis of most talk therapy, and it's often fundamental to being able to effectively communicate with your partners or your friends or your family. However, there are many reasons why this might be hard to do. Today, we'll be talking about what gets in the way of talking through our feelings, what the research says about it, and we're going to look at some concrete techniques to try the next time you're struggling to put your emotions into words. So let, let's start out with the fundamental question. What, why express our feelings? Why words? Why do words? Why feelings into words? <laughs> I mean, longtime listeners will remember that Dedeker has stated many times she would prefer to just interpretive dance yes. all of her... Yes, difficult I, I think conversation. Yeah. Since my early to mid 20s, I've made a very intentional effort to be better about putting my feelings into words and mm. being a better communicator. But really deep down, if I had my way, it would be all <laughs> ecstatic dance all the time. <laughs> I like that idea. I it actually that brought up something like a time recently in my life where I felt like I couldn't really put my feelings into words and it was during the beginning of the pandemic when I would just like find myself crying for no reason or no no like mm. uh, cerebral idea in my head of you know this is the concrete reason as to why I am crying right now it just kind of voluntarily <laughs> occurred and I wonder if that that was probably just a trauma response or something but but that's interesting yeah because it, it, sometimes you you simply like don't have the words for your emotions in a moment. Yes. Yeah. Well, so can we just brainstorm about when are the most common situations where we're expected to be able to express our feelings or put our emotions into words? When you're fighting with your partner. Oh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) That's a good one. I'd say also when you're getting into a relationship or maybe navigating changes in a relationship. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. so we're yeah. talking about getting more serious, whatever that means in your context, or moving in together or getting married or, you know, whatever kind of thing, or just starting a relationship at all. There's kind of this, this, you know, I guess lots of people have dedicated their lives to writing poetry, trying to find ways to express with words <laughs> those sorts of feelings. Yeah. Well, thinking about the beginning of a relationship or relationship transitions makes me think about how it's really important to be able to express mixed emotions as well because sometimes Mm -hmm. I think it's not quite as easy as I'm in love with you I want to be in a relationship with you often it can be I'm in love with you and also I feel apprehension and fear and I'm worried you might reject me and I'm worried if I can be the kind of person that I should be in this relationship you know all kinds of feelings as well that I do think that when we're able to express those things more honestly it tends to set us up more for success in most situations what else? This also reminds me of when you like to say to us, Dedeker, what, what do you want the audience to feel from this episode <laughs> before we start recording? And I'm like, ah, I'm happy that I listened to it. <laughs> yeah, but that's also challenging. I think any large decision in general, especially when you need to sort of relate to someone like, okay, these are my feelings around this decision. These are the reasons as to why I'm doing it. And this is my motivation for it, perhaps, like feelings, I think, come up in those situations as well. Yeah. And I know that Jace has mentioned on previous episodes, the fact that from a scientific 
neurochemistry basis that when it comes to making decisions, actually we're very much swayed by our emotion. You know, that Mm -hmm. people who have some kind of brain injury where they're much more hyperlogical or hyperrational and don't have as much access to a sense of emotionality actually really struggle with making decisions, even really simple decisions that you would think would be easy for someone who's purely riding on their like logic power. That actually being able to get in touch with our feelings about either side of a decision is very crucial. And I imagine it's kind of not, it's not even just about being able to express those feelings to someone else who may be listening, but I think also getting clear on that with yourself as well, right? I think that's part of decision making is getting clear with yourself. What are my feelings about all the different ways that I could go here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, I mean, when it comes to something like if you were journaling, trying to help make a decision and be like, what, get to the, I'm going to get to the bottom of what I really feel about this. If you have a hard time putting into words what it is you're feeling, that that's going to be harder, right? It's going to be harder to write down those feelings and kind of work through why am I, why am I hesitating about this decision or why do I want to do this when it seems like a bad idea or, you know, whatever it is that, that having words for those can really help. I also find for myself, I will sometimes just feel weird in some kind of way. I'm sure both of you yes, have we know. Oh, yes. I can, to can attest this. to this phenomenon yes. that Jace all the I'm time is like, I just I feel weird. I yeah. don't know what I feel. I just, I feel weird. I don't, yeah. and yeah, having often, I'm going to just express my experience of <laughs> okay. it. That okay. Sometimes Great. I seem to, yeah, struggle between, is it positive? Is it negative? Is it... High energy is it low energy? Is yeah. it excitement? Is it anxiety? Is anxiety, it dread? Is yeah. it mixed emotions? Is it not? Am I just tired? Oh, you know that sometimes. <laughs> right. Obviously, not all the time, but yeah, sometimes you will have those moments of just really being not sure about what you're feeling in a in a particular moment. And that's almost like trying to put a name to a physiological response that's happening within your body. And that's absolutely that's yeah. really interesting and also potentially confusing because I know we we've talked about this just on the show that our our acting teacher Steve Easton always would say like you know that that ner- kind of nervousness or uh butterfly feeling in your stomach like you can just sort of turn that on its head and call that excitement instead but there are moments where that really truly is nervousness or are they just the same thing like what what is that there yeah and those the physiological responses that go with certain emotions have a lot of overlap with each other, kind of like you were just talking about there. Yeah. Like nervousness and excitement share a lot of similar properties, the same as like excitement or NRE and fear actually have a lot in common. Mm-hmm. So like the physical symptoms you'll have on a roller coaster, right? It's like we talk about love being like a roller coaster, that that fear response that your body is physically having that we do seek out because it is kind of exciting is very similar to that kind of becoming infatuated with someone kind of feeling and that in you know and this this isn't really the subject of what we're getting into today but like there have been studies done showing how you can kind of cause people to think they're feeling one thing by just creating the physical symptoms and not actually you know what you would think it would come from the brain first and then it would be physical but that it's actually kind of the other physical way around first and, and then the response and, together yeah yeah Absolutely. Yeah. We do that. I did that in uh, acting classes that mm, you just create sure. the physiological like response, essentially, or not response, but you create the action physically and then it causes you to do something like cry or whatever, just because physically you're doing it initially. It's right. strange stuff, but emotions are wild. <laughs> they really are. Yeah. And our bodies are wild, but it's cool. So let's get into why and when it's difficult to express our feelings and emotions. Well, you already volunteered when it's your first time going through a pandemic. Yes, that's true. Yep. It's a good one. Classic time, difficult <laughs> Baby's to express Baby's first pandemic, feelings. yes. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> I know, but, but truly. And sorry, the actual babies, it was their first pandemic too. But well, I wait, also, it was all of our first pandemic. Yes, it was you're all right. of Baby's first pandemic. All, we were all babies. All our little babies. Yes, all our yeah. little baby people out there. <laughs> It's very true. So influence from family culture. So if you come from a culture or a family of origin that sort of de-emphasized or even punished expressing emotions or having emotions, that can make it very difficult for you in other situations with other people like your partner 
it might make it difficult for you to express feelings or express emotions or even understand really what's going on in there. I think, yeah, before my partner started going to therapy, that was definitely challenging for him. He was like, I don't know, I, I, I'm not quite sure what I'm feeling here and stuff. And, and then sort of unpacking some of the family of origin stuff that helped him out a lot. And also, one may have internalized meta-emotional beliefs that negative or difficult emotions are just a waste of time. Things like they shouldn't be dwelled on, they're dangerous. You know, it, we have those phrases in our culture, I think, that like, boys, you know, need to not cry, don't cry, mm-hmm. like be a man, stuff like that. I, I think that that's probably very challenging. I'm I'm not a man, but... I can. I, I'm assuming, Jace, that the that might be something that's really challenging to grow up with. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that it's interesting because the fact that the way that this tends to play out is is actually framed in a more positive light. You know, I think our brains tend to go to that. Oh, yeah, we know it's really unhealthy to repress your emotions or stuff them down or bottle them up. We all know that, but that's not good. But the way I see this play out, for instance, in my relationships or with my clients is it's often framed more in the sense of we shouldn't mm-hmm. dwell on uh, these kind of like things. positive thinking kind of Yeah, thing. maybe a little bit. <laughs> toxic almost, positivity. Almost, and yeah, not even right. going that far as toxic positivity, but just more of the de-emphasizing this kind of sense of like, ooh, negative emotions, we really shouldn't give them any weight or any mm. time or any focus. Mm. We should just ignore them because why would you just sit and be miserable? You know, like it's not worth our time to just sit and be miserable. And that's how more right. I, how I see it framed is a little bit in this slightly more positive seeming light. And of course, there's definitely some merits to that. But it's interesting, the Gottman Institute have found that partners who have what they call a meta emotion mismatch so as in the way these two people feel about the importance of feelings, if that's mismatched, there's much more likely to be strife and conflict in the relationship, which makes total sense, right? If you have one person yeah, right. who's like, ooh, this hard feeling I'm having, let's sit and talk about it and think about it and pick it apart. And one person is like, no, 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 we need to just kind of roll with the punches and move, move past on. it and let yeah. it go. You know, right. that, we that don't can... give it more power than it than it needs to have deserves or or, like exactly that. yeah no, and i could see good arguments on either side so right. yeah yes. makes sense yeah so that's influence from the microculture of the family that we grew up in but we can also have influences from our macro culture or our society that make it difficult to express our feelings i think the big obvious one that many of us live with is your particular race or ethnicity or your gender may have been historically punished for expressing either the wrong emotions or expressing them in the wrong way in particular. And so that can mean that maybe there's particular emotions you feel more pressure to not express or to keep a lid on or to express it as, oh, actually, it's this other thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is this is such a big one. And it's kind of like what Emily was getting at with, you know, boys being taught not to cry either taught directly by their parents or just through their peers, what they see on TV, whatever. And and similarly, you know, girls are often punished for anger or for any kind of aggression like that. Mm -hmm. And so kind of you can lose access to those feelings by repeatedly being told to to shut it down, which then it kind of diverts into other feelings, but it can make it really difficult to talk about. And I'd say even another side of that is like with anger, that for men, while expressing anger growing up, you're not sort of punished for in the same way, but people are more likely to be scared of you. Yeah. And you can hurt people when you're angry in a way that women are just less likely to do, partly because of how we're socialized, but also partly just physical size or whatever, right? And so there's kind of, good and bad reasons for being in control of those. But but what we're talking about here is kind of finding ways to access talking about them. And I think sometimes when we're told to sort of shut down the physical responses to them, we also are kind of taught to shut down even talking about them, even being able to express them calmly. And we're not always going to be calm when we're talking about these, but just the ability to talk about them at all can go away. I'd say another one that makes it hard to talk about and express your emotions is when you're just feeling detached from them. And this could be good boundaries that are keeping you safe while you're processing after a trauma or after being hurt. 
this could be sort of not because of trauma necessarily, but sort of like Dedeker was getting at of just being like, well, I'm just going to kind of think my way around this and not, you know, I'm not going to dwell on that. I'm going to, you know, power of positive thought, whatever can make it even hard to access or talk about those emotions. This can also come up as a side effect of SSRIs, you know, of antidepressants or of depression itself that, you know, these can be symptoms like I, the brief while while I was on an SSRI in college, it was like I didn't have any feelings hmm. for a few months while I was on that because I had a pretty bad reaction to it, but I just had no feelings at all, physically, emotionally, or, or otherwise. And so it did make it hard to express what was going on for me because it, I just wasn't feeling it. So, so there's a lot of different factors that could be causing you to be more detached from your emotions. I think some emotional detachment can be the result of spiritual bypassing, which is something that I've gone through many periods of in my life. And particularly since I started meditating like a decade ago, that sometimes a little bit, that can be a maladaptive coping mechanism when upsetting things come up or I have upsetting feelings. And I'm just like, okay, I'm just going to meditate it out. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then just like wait for the feeling to pass and then I'm good. And some of that is good, right? You know, it's a, the way that I often think about it is it's better for me to sit and meditate it out rather than like snap at someone or just totally fly off the handle at someone. However, often what would happen is I would meditate it out, let it go, and then not bring it up again. And unfortunately, that was like a weird way of both detaching and stuffing because of course it came out eventually much later down the road. So I think that can be another thing that's maybe even pressure or perceived pressure to be more chill or be more Buddhist or be more meditative or more mindful can sometimes cause some emotional detachment. So all of these things are related to this phenomenon, let's say, known as alexithymia. Now, alexithymia, it's, it's this word that basically refers to, you know, this phenomenon of having difficulty experiencing, identifying, or expressing emotions. And it's not an illness. It's not a disorder. It's not like you can't get a clinical diagnosis of alexithymia. Basically, it's just this is sort of one of the symptoms that can occur and co-occur with certain mental health conditions. So it can be anything from genetics to environmental factors to brain injury. It could occur as a result of trauma or PTSD. There was a really tiny study of 22 war veterans with PTSD found that 41% had alexithymia. There are some theories floating around out there that the way that our brain works as far as survival mechanisms goes, there's a section in our brain called the Broca's area. And Broca's area is responsible for processing our thoughts into speech, essentially. Hmm. And hmm. Okay. when we're under threat and when our survival, uh, our survival techniques, our fight or flight response is activated, Broca's area is one of the first areas of our brain to kind of go quiet. Ooh, and that, get that de explains so much. <laughs> yes. Be I'm because very yeah. Yeah, I, because I feel I, like I that think, happens a lot to me. Yeah, from a survival response. <clears throat> if we've gotten to the point where we know we're not talking our way out of this one, then it's less important to be able to talk. And it's mm. more important to be able to run or or to fight physically. Now, the studies that that look at Broca's area so far have been small and there's, you know, our researcher for this episode also was skeptical that maybe this could be applied generally across the board. But I do think it is interesting to think about. And, and I think it does make a lot of sense and tracks for a lot of people that I know, including myself, with PTSD symptoms that often you can have feelings that come up or memories that come up or flashbacks that come up and you're not able to actually articulate what you're feeling and thinking. You're not able to actually speak the words, but you know what's going on inside of you. And I think it's important just to express that for everyone listening who does have PTSD to know that that's a pretty normal thing. I think that we can sometimes judge that as, oh gosh, you're clamming up or, oh gosh, you don't have any emotional intelligence. You're not able to talk about these things, but, but it may be mm -hmm. linked to literally like a physiological basis. Yeah, and speaking that of that... Sense. Alexithymia could occur as a result of neurodivergence. There was a 2018 study that suggested that possibly up to half of people on the autism spectrum may experience some form of alexithymia. And then also, like Jace mentioned, it could also occur as a result of mental illness or other mental health issues such as depression. I'm wondering, do the two of you have a sense of 
other times when it's just straight up difficult to put your feelings into words or to express them to somebody? All the time. <laughs> I'm really think, hoping to learn something from this episode oh, here. Because yeah. I do struggle with this. And I think, like we talked about earlier, you've both witnessed me struggling with like, I don't know how to describe mm. what it is that I'm feeling, but I'm feeling something. And I, I'm having a hard time telling what it is. And it's something I'm still working on years later. Yeah, I, I guess in conflict, just when you and your partner are sort of talking at cross purposes and when they have a story about what's going on, you have a story about what's going on, and it feels as though you're you're trying to convey exactly what's happening within you and what your feelings and emotions are, but they're not getting it. I think going through all of this, I'm getting the impression that both being in situations that require us to express our feelings and also being in situations where it's really, really, really hard to express our feelings seems to happen all the time. It seems like it's part of the human <laughs> yeah. experience and part of the life experience and something that we all go through. Thank goodness, because, yeah, as you said, it is very universal. Mm -hmm. So now we're going to move on to what the research has to say about all of this. So there are several studies that support the notion that being able to put a name to an emotion is beneficial for our well-being. I suppose that would be nice if all of us could just say like, yeah, this is what I'm feeling. Here you go. Mm -hmm. It's on a nice platter. <laughs> But a 2007 study by a UCLA professor of psychology, Michael Lieberman, found that putting feelings into words makes sadness, anger, and pain less intense. So there was this study that was conducted using brain imaging from participants, and essentially they were just shown images of individuals making different emotional expressions. And then below the picture of the face, they saw either two words like angry or fearful, something along those lines. And the participants had to choose which emotion described the face. Or they saw two names like Harry and Sally, and then they had to choose the gender appropriate name that matched the face. So when participants attached the word angry, there was a decreased response in the amygdala. So they were basically seeing the emotion and then choosing a word for the emotion. And then there was a decreased response in their amygdala. But when they attached a name, there was no reduction in the amygdala response. So, and so yeah. they were feeling whatever kind of physiological, mental, brain chemical response to someone making that face. Is that I, kind of what we're getting at, I think? I think it even like decreases that. It, it just is essentially saying... But I mean, looking, they... They oh. have it first. They have the reaction first. Their amygdala fires up going like, ah, I see someone being angry or mm -hmm. I see someone looking sad or whatever it is. And that by naming the person, they were still experiencing that. But by naming the emotion, but naming someone else's emotion, that's interesting. But I guess mm -hmm. we're also kind of, we feel an emotion when we see someone else. Right, because we also have the mirror neurons that yeah. uh, show up, even if we don't necessarily in our conscious brain notice that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So according to Lieberman, when we feel angry, we have increased activity in the part of the brain called the amygdala, which we just talked about. And the amygdala is responsible for detecting fear and setting off series of biological alarms and responses to protect the body from danger. We've talked about that in like our fight, flight and fear mm -hmm. episode. Uh, so when the angry feeling is labeled, Lieberman and researchers noted a decreased response in the amygdala and in an, and an increased activity in the right ventrolateral prefrontal cortex. And this part of the brain is involved with inhibiting behavior and processing emotions. Interesting. Okay, so it like turns you from just reacting to processing. Yeah. That's interesting. I, essentially, one part of the brain is having the emotional response and maybe going into this sort of fear-based or action-based response. And the other one is, you know, processing the emotions and inhibiting behavior. So right. Lieberman explained it this way, and this is a quote, when you put feelings into words, you're activating this prefrontal region and seeing a reduced response in the amygdala. And the same way that you'd hit the brakes when you're driving, when you see a yellow light, when you put feelings into words, you seem to be hitting the brakes on your emotional responses. As a result, a person may feel less angry or less sad. So what if you're someone who sees a yellow and then you smash the gas? That's a really good point. <laughs> That's a really good point. 
perhaps this wouldn't work as well on them. Like most of Los Angeles. <laughs> yeah, right. I try yeah. to do the opposite, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe they saw the picture and they're like, I label this as angry and smash the picture in half. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I like thinking about that, though, this idea that something as quote unquote simple as I'm just going to say the word angry when I feel angry, that just forces your brain to function in a slightly different way. It's, really interesting. it's like a brain yeah. hack. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Because <laughs> you're it, it just like putting what a name to a response and then therefore maybe your brain is able to process it better in some way. I don't well, it's literally know. by like forcing that part of the brain to to work right to work the part yeah where true. i process the information it it inhibits the amygdala mm-hmm. i don't know it's wild yeah yeah that's cool i have a slightly more upsetting study Uh-oh. to tell you about Great. Great. so this <laughs> yeah. is a 2016 study that was also conducted at ucla by dr michelle krask it was published in the journal psychology science so they took a group of 88 participants and it was all people who had a fear of spiders so, and, okay, all normal people. Right? All normal people. <laughs> I should put in a content warning. If you can't, if you like have very intense arachnophobia, maybe skip past this part. Skip a few okay. minutes ahead. So get these normal people with a fear of spiders. <laughs> gather them outside and put them in front of an open container that had a live tarantula in it. And Just don't live in Arizona, people, because they're everywhere. <laughs> so... The participants, first they were instructed, okay, just get as close as you can to the spider, whether that's two inches, a two inch step forward, or if you can get as far as to even touching it, then just see how far you can get. (laughs) Uh Then they took the group and they divided them randomly into four groups and they brought them indoors. And they all had to sit in front of yet another live tarantula that was sitting behind a screen. So you could see it? No, you could see it. You knew it was there. Oh, okay. You could see it. It was there, but there's a screen. There's like a, a glass screen. You. Protecting yeah, you. Bulletproof yes. glass. <laughs> <you from> the- <laughs> Does this tarantula have a small gun? Like, what's yeah. happening? <laughs> yes. And also, in case you were wondering, the study paper itself included photos of said oh, good. tarantula. I'm really good. Oh, I, I bet it was adorable and fuzzy. Uh, and also specifically made it clear anytime they mentioned the tarantula in the text, in parentheses, they would have to include what their leg span was, which was six inches. Like, I think just to drive home, yes, Dang. it was a scary spider. It's a big spider. It's a yeah. scary big Tarantula. spider. Yeah. Okay, so let me talk to you about these four groups. So one group was asked to do what's known as affect labeling. So as in, while sitting in front of the spider that was behind the screen, they were asked to verbally describe the experience of being around the spider and to label what they were feeling. So for example, saying... I'm really scared of this huge tarantula that's sitting three inches away from me and I hate it. So, okay, got the, it. <laughs> All right. Yes. The second group was instructed to do what's known as reappraisal. So they were instructed to express a more neutral sentiment, both about the spider and about their feelings. So they were instructed to say something like, yeah, looking at the spider isn't dangerous for me. Or yeah. I know that I'm safe because the spider's behind a screen and also it's a tiny spider that can't actually hurt me. So kind of reappraising what their feelings were. It's not tiny, but yeah. <laughs> Relatively tiny. <laughs> Relative compared to, to a, to human, a human, yeah. yes. <laughs> Third group was told to express a sentence that had something to do with a piece of furniture in their home. In other words, something that had nothing to do with the spider. And this is a technique known as distraction. So they have to say like, I have a desk in the corner of my room at home, something like that. Mm -hmm. And then the fourth group was instructed not to say anything. They were just told to just sit in front of the spider. And this is known as exposure, right? Which I think we're we're pretty... Exposure therapy? Yeah, kind of like exposure therapy. These four groups did this. How are you doing, Jace? Do you need a break? You good? No, this is you can great. handle it? it. Okay. You know, I'm loving this. this <laughs> okay. is so much fun. I hear look, some breathing you look over there. Visibly just... <laughs> upset. Do you want to put your emotions into words here? <laughs> well, I want to hear the rest of the study and then I'll decide which course decide I which want to take. Okay. Got it. Okay. So then they brought all the participants back one week later and they again took them outside. They were re exposed to the live tarantula in the open container. They were told to get as close as they possibly could, even touch it with a bare finger, if they could. And Dr. Krask and her colleagues measured how close all the participants were able to get to the spider, how distressed they were. They tracked their physiological responses. Specifically, they were measuring how much their hands sweated, which is a pretty good like standard measure of fear <laughs> and adrenaline. 
Are you feeling some hand sweats right A little now, bit, but that might just be from recording a podcast. It's hard to say. <laughs> and so they found that the group that did the affect labeling, that labeled their fear of the spider, performed better than the other groups. They were able to get closer. They were less emotionally aroused and their hands were sweating significantly less. So they come to the conclusion that compared to all the other approaches like reappraising or distracting Hmm. or just exposure, the group that was able to just verbally say out loud and acknowledge their feelings kind of were able to, quote unquote, conquer them a little bit easier. That's surprising, actually. I would not have expected that to be the one with the most significant results in terms of less fear next time around. Yeah, what would you have expected? I guess I kind of thought that the reappraisal group, the one that described how the spider was not Mm. actually dangerous to them, I guess my brain went that that one would have been the most successful. Yeah. The idea of trying to write a sentence about a piece of furniture in my home while a spider is there staring at me (laughs) is just like, that seems like an upsetting situation right there. Or simply just having to be silent. Right. Yeah. 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 (laughs) Silently stare at the strand spider. Yeah. Boy, oh boy. So that is interesting. Now, there are many, many, many studies like this. There's a lot of research out there that really supports this conclusion that naming our emotions or affect labeling is good for us, that it helps us to reduce the intensity of that emotion and just helps us to have better well-being. However, surprise, I have a contender. A contender enters the ring. I did find a study that essentially says, that's all bullshit. Hmm. Naming your emotions may actually get in the way of you being able to regulate and process them. Yeah, so this is a 2021 study. Brand so new. Brand wow. spanking new. Published <laughs> new study in, smell. Yes. Published in Affective Science. Suggests, like Dedeker said, that maybe that's not so effective. So this particular study had 81 participants, also broken up into four groups. Apparently that's the hot way to handle this kind of research. <laughs> that's the hot number of groups for for emotion naming therapy tests. So they were exposed to several rounds of negative or upsetting images. And those did include then, images of spiders as of course, well. Really? Yeah. Of course. Yes. Why, yeah. They're basically, yeah. There's the same study. They just the low hanging fruit a spider of the yeah. upsetting yeah. things. Yeah. Right. Okay. So negative or upsetting images. So these four groups were split up. One that simply did re-exposure, just, you know, like we talked about before, just saw the things again. The next one would name the emotion they were feeling. The third group would was told to regulate their emotions through reappraisal, but to do it silently. So just kind of thinking through, you know, reasons, more neutral explanations for what's going on. And then the fourth group did both naming and then also trying to regulate their emotions through reappraisal. And What's interesting here is, so the way that they analyzed this was looking at the self-reported negative effects of, you know, how they were feeling. And they found that those who named their emotion before trying to reappraise were less effective at reappraising and regulating their emotions than people who didn't name their feelings beforehand. And essentially, the researchers said that it seemed to indicate that naming the feelings almost kind of solidified them or locked Mm. them in and that then it was harder to get out of that feeling. Now, before you all throw up your hands and just close your podcast machine and (laughs) say, forget it. One thing to take into account here is that the authors of the study themselves did mention that it's weird (laughs) that there are so many other studies showing essentially the opposite thing and realizing it's possible that that they're missing something or that there's something just different about the methodology of this study that's causing the result. And this is brand new, right? So there hasn't been a lot of time for people to replicate it or to, you know, go through other studies based on this one to see if, you know, what factors might change those results. They talked about things to take into account, like differences between hearing those negative things versus seeing them or whether people are generating the labels for the emotions themselves or they're picking from a list. Like there's mm. lots of different factors that might be affecting this. And so it's not, we don't want to say like, oh, this one study means it's all bullshit. That's not how science works. But <laughs> just that it is interesting that there are some other findings as well. 
I find that interesting because we talk a lot of, on the show about like self-soothing tactics and how to sort of emotionally regulate. And perhaps what they found is that by saying the emotion again, it just kind of perpetuates it as opposed to lessen it or dampen it. I don't know. I'm just theorizing here, but yeah. I yeah. think my takeaway is maybe just different strokes for different folks. You know, I'm thinking about how it seems like the takeaways from this particular study was that if you're someone who wants to use, like maybe you use reframing and reappraising as a tactic. There's a lot of therapy that's based on reframing mm-hmm. and reframing situations and reframing the thoughts and the things that we tell ourselves about situations. And if that's what works for you, then maybe putting an emphasis on, no, I need to label my emotions might get in the way with that. They also said in the study that, you know, naming the emotions got in the way of uh, what they call mindful acceptance. So, which is, you know, kind of being aware of the body sensations coming up and then trying to move to a place of acceptance and, and letting the feeling go. That if that's what tends to work for you and helps you feel good, then yes, maybe sitting and quote unquote dwelling on the emotion by speaking it out loud may get in the way with that. But yeah. if you're someone where you know that when you are able to pinpoint your emotion and label it and express it to someone that does make you feel better, then maybe that's the way to go. So again, of course, there still needs to be more studies. This needs to, there's probably needs to be more studies seeing if this phenomenon is repeatable before we can make any hard and fast conclusions. But just based on this information, I think that's the conclusion I would come to. Yeah. And I think so with this whole first part that we've gone through, I think it's also worth noting that all of these studies are just looking at how naming emotions affects your ability to regulate those, which, you know, can be very powerful and and it can be really useful to give those labels. But none of them are looking at was a lot of the things we talked about, which is like when I need to communicate this to someone else, right? So, so even if that last study, it's like, yeah, that's the way it is. When it comes to communicating with you know someone close to you, then you do need those words, right? That's that's a different situation. So in either case, I think that's that's a really powerful skill to have, and one that I'm hoping to improve through this episode for myself <laughs> personally. Okay, well, we are going to get to specifically different approaches, different techniques that you can use for putting your feelings into words. But first, we're going to take a break to talk about the sponsors for this week's episode and ways that you can help support the show so that we can keep this information coming out there for free. There's a certain crispness to the air that's happening right now. It's it's starting to get a little cold out there, a little maybe chilly and snowy and We're all looking for a way to get a little warmer. So why don't you heat things up by going to our sponsor for this week, Dipsy. Dipsy is an audio app full of short, sexy stories designed to turn you on. Each story features characters that feel like real people, immersive scenarios, really well sound designed, well acted, well written, and there's new content every week. So there's always more to explore no matter what you're into or what turns you on. And if you want to wind down at night, they also have wellness sessions and sensual bedtime stories and soundscapes to help you drift off to sleep. For listeners of the show, Dipsy is offering an extended 30-day free trial when you go to dipsystories.com slash multi. That's 30 days of full access for free when you go to D-I-P-S-E-A stories.com slash multi. Dipsystories.com slash multi. Social media was once this really fun place to hang out, but now I kind of just doom scroll when I go on social media platforms and everybody has like their super curated lives and sometimes there's a lot of misinformation floating around. It's not my favorite place to be, quite frankly. However, our sponsor for this week, Swell, is changing the game with their social media platform. Swell is an asynchronous voice-based social platform where you can have conversations with people all over the world on your own time. Definitely the irritating thing about social media is that you lose tone of voice, intention, emotionality behind what somebody is saying. And so it's really, really easy to misconstrue how someone's feeling when they're saying something to you. And you know that Over audio, people can become much more real, more authentic when you're able to hear all of those things behind what they're saying. So on Swell, you can broadcast your voice to ask a question, share an opinion, or just tell a funny story and connect with a diverse array of people. 
they have stations centered around specific themes, pop culture, hobbies. Specifically, they have an LGBTQIA station. There's a lot of creators on there talking about polyamory, talking about non-monogamy, and discussing a lot of similar questions like the ones that we tackle on this show. And right now, you can download the Swell app for free on the App Store. When you do, go check out the LGBTQIA plus station to chat about topics like the ones that we discuss on this show, like doing relationships better or non-monogamy. Again, just download the Swell app by typing Swell, S-W-E-L-L, into your App Store, or you can check out the link in this episode's description. The holiday season is upon us, and it might be a good time to not only get a fun, sexy surprise for your loved ones, but also for yourself. And that's where Mm. our sponsor, Like a Kitten, can help out. Absolutely. They can help you out by choosing your own adventure with their BYOB box, which is the build your own box. So you get to choose one item out of of each of their six categories, which are toys, beauty products, lubes and cleansers, games, sexy accessories and lingerie. So I got to choose a bunch of amazing items. So I got a little travel Uber lube, which I'm so excited to try next week when I go out of town. Uh, I got a beautiful, sexy robe that I still wear. I got a fun a coloring book, and an amazing vibrator, which I really enjoy using with and without a partner. And the vibrators generally on the site cost over $69, but the entire box itself is $69. So you get all of that other stuff basically for free. And also a portion of the sales go to charities that focus on women's empowerment, education, and health. So you can feel good about giving yourself an orgasm. Right now, Like a Kitten is offering our listeners 20% off and free shipping when you go to likeakitten.com slash multi or enter promo code multi at checkout. Just go to likeakitten.com slash multi or use promo code multi to get 20% off these incredible boxes. Likeakitten.com slash multi. And the link is in this episode's description. Hey, multi Emery listeners. We believe that regardless of what relationship style you're in, you should have access to content that acknowledges you, affirms you, and includes you. And we also think that that information should be freely available. There's a trend that's going on right now, you may have noticed with podcasts, that a lot of them are starting to move behind paywalls. Some of the big companies are trying to monetize podcasts by making you pay to listen to them at all or to hear more than one episode of them. But it's really important for us to be able to offer this show to everyone out there for free and to be able to offer things like listener hangouts and stuff like that. And the main way that we've been able to do that so far is from the contributions of our Patreon community. That's right. Our Patreon community is really what keeps this show going. And it also is a way that we can give back to you. We have a private Facebook group. We have Discord communities. um, And we can also give you things through Patreon, like early releases, things like bonus episodes. We have regular video discussion groups, which are really, really incredible every single month. We have so many amazing people from all over the world joining them. And it's just a lovely way to interact with our community. And also, sometimes we're going to throw you some free merch. And isn't that cool? (laughs) I love free merch. So if this show has brought you value, if you love the fact that that it's coming to you for free. It's giving people out there some great information on relationships, regardless of what sort of relationship configuration you're in. And if you want to interact with our amazing community, then go to patreon.com slash and join us. We would love to have you and we really, really appreciate the support. And we're back. We have here for your listening pleasure and <laughs> life pleasure, communication pleasure, Hmm, Anyway, we have four different approaches for putting your feelings into words. Again, we recommend getting creative, get experimental. You know, the way that your partner or your best friend is able to put their feelings into words may not be what works best for you. So like we like to say on this show, be a scientist. Be a scientist of yourself. Get that data. Play around (laughs) with stuff. Put yourself out there. I I believe the term we usually like to use is put on your scientist hat. Yes, mm-hmm. yes. Or apparently pants scientists or all wear hats. <laughs> Put on your scientist costume. 
Oh, cute. Oh, yeah. 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 That's good. Halloween just always... happened. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, actually, you could probably get a scientist costume real cheap right now, right? Definitely. <laughs> okay. Don't do that. Anyway, the first technique that we're going to talk about is using an emotion wheel. And the reason why I say an emotion wheel instead of the emotion wheel is because there's a bunch of them out there. There's a whole bunch of different emotion wheels that people have made. And essentially, it's just a list of different emotions arranged in a circular shape <laughs> of some sort. <laughs> there you go. Often, With pretty often colors. kind of grouped and categorized together so that similar emotions are you know near each other around the circle. There's things like the Geneva wheel, the Uno wheel, and there's a bunch of others. But the one that probably most people are familiar with is the Plutchik wheel. And he was he was actually American, so they probably called him Plutchik. But <laughs> Plutchik is probably how his ancestors pronounced the name. Who was developed by psychologist Robert Plutchik in 1980. So if you, you know, at home, if you just do a search for this, you should be able to find it. It's P-L-U-T. C H I K Plutchik. I'm sure if you just get close, the search engines will figure out what you're going for. <laughs> so the Plutchik wheel, it kind of looks like a flower. And each petal of the flower is a different color. And it goes from darker, more saturated colors in the middle, which are more intense emotions. And then each one goes out toward less saturated, more pastelish colors toward the outside that are kind of the less intense versions of those. So as a quick example, on one side of the circle, the innermost one is rage. And then outside of that's anger and outside of that's annoyance. So you see it's kind of like stepping down in intensity. Or another one is like ecstasy is in the middle and joy is a little farther out. And then serenity, a little farther out from that. And then he's also got outside of that some other feelings that are kind of like blends of different feelings that are, again, kind of more detached on the outside. Mm -hmm. Mixed emotions, yeah. So definitely check it out. It's interesting. But effectively, there's there's no wrong way to use an emotion wheel. But basically, the idea is just, rather than just having a list of, you know, I'm trying to figure out, and this is something I actually am interested to try. So next time, Dedeker and Emily, I'm struggling to express how I'm feeling. Whip out the emotion wheel. Pull up one of these. Yeah. No, I, I know we have some listeners who who have an emotion wheel that's laminated and put on their fridge so that oh. it's there at all yeah. times. And maybe that's something we can arrange for you, Jace, yeah. to just whip out your emotion wheel. Yeah. Okay. I like that. I'll give it a try. So, so yeah, just basically looking at it and what's helpful about the way that the different words are grouped together is that if you find something that's even close to what you're feeling or you think might be close to it, you can look at what's around it and go, well, it's like this, but it's like, it's sort of like fear, but it's a little more uh, toward like surprise maybe. And then when you're looking at the wheel and you've picked out a word or maybe a few words that kind of describe what you think might be going on, this can then be a conversation prompt with you know, your your partner or someone else close to you to then start exploring it and saying, well, what might have been the trigger for this feeling? What might have set that off? If there's a mix of emotions, maybe talking about each of them, because maybe they had different instigating things, you know, different triggers for each of them, or maybe the same thing kind of caused multiple feelings, just sort of as a starting point for exploring it. Also things like, does this emotion feel old and familiar? Like, oh yeah, this, I have this often. Let me try to find a word for it. Or it's like, I don't know, this is weird. I feel different. Let me try to come up with a word for it. That all these are just kind of, again, starting points for conversation, for communicating about how it is that you're feeling or trying to evaluate even for yourself. I'm reacting a certain way to something. You know, like you're trying to make a decision. Like, what is What is this reaction I'm having? going through the same kind of process even by yourself, or if you're a spewer, going through it with someone else just to work through it for yourself can be a a great starting place. Another tactic you can use is a mood journal. We've got the five-minute journal. We've got the dream journal. Now we've got a mood oh. journal. Oh, we also had the Stoics journal. Don't you have a Stoic yeah, journal? The I Daily Stoic? In, yes. And the I bullet do. journal. We've yes. got all kinds of journals. Just stacks stacks journals. journals on top of journals. <laughs> So you can record how you're feeling and what you're thinking. 
uh, in this mood journal. Because when you do that, you can kind of track your emotions. You can notice people or places that are triggers. You can recognize things like warning signs or strong emotions. Uh, Just sort of, you know, doing a little outline of like how you're feeling throughout the day at the end of the day. I like that idea. It's, it, you know, you do that with any type of journaling, but this specifically is talking about your moods. So, okay, at bedtime or whenever you have a few quiet moments, outline the following columns to help you reflect on a few of your biggest emotions from the day. So in column one, write the emotion name and then write what caused the emotion and then the behaviors or the actions that this emotion emotion caused me to take So if you were super pissed off for some reason, what happened as a cause of that? Did you snap at your partner? Did you want to hit a pillow or something? Throw a candy cane across the room. I don't or know did why you I make thought a of a bad candy decision. Candy cane. <laughs> were... See, that sounds very specific, and like you have yeah. a very real memory. I was caroling to that. last night. <laughs> we're talking okay. about candy canes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I uh, and then next. Uh, ask yourself, was this emotion appropriate to the situation? That's really interesting. And I think like a nice thing to ask yourself mm-hmm. in the moment. And then finally, is this situation a distress to be tolerated or a problem to be solved? I like that. That's mm-hmm. really interesting. Because yeah, sometimes you're just going to have an emotion or an annoyance or whatever, but you have to ask yourself, am I going to die on this mountain? Am I going to get pissed off about it? Am I going to try to solve this problem or not? Or is it simply just something to be tolerated? I like that. Yeah. I think I'm going to try this mood journal. Yeah, I think the, the power of the mood journal comes from doing it regularly, not yeah. just when you're trying to process something, but doing it more regularly so that you have this context. You can identify so that- patterns. Exactly, yeah, that you start to see those. Because I could definitely see a situation where something comes up and you say, well, I think this is just a distress to be tolerated. And if you notice, this is in my journal like every other day Mm. for months, maybe this is moving into the category of a problem to be solved. Yeah, right. Maybe this is a problem in my relationship or my workplace or, you know, whatever that I need to fix. Or, you know, maybe it's not, but like it gives you that context. Whereas if you just thought about each one of those in isolation, you wouldn't know that. All right. Approach number three is SIFT. I love this one and I use it all the time. So this was is it originated... just because it's an acronym? Is that why you love it so it much? It is an acronym. That sounds like something you'd love, Jess. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> well, the thing I love about acronyms is acronyms are a wonderful thing. They are. The That's sort of a circular logic there. I love spree. acronyms um, <laughs> because they're wonderful. <laughs> I was trying to do a Tigger reference, but... Oh, that's good. Yeah. yeah. No, really, though, what I love about acronyms is I appreciate that in moments when I am very emotionally activated or have a bunch of confusing, chaotic emotions going on, that I can remember it most of the time. If it's a short acronym, yes, it's it's something to sink my teeth into. It's something to just do again that maybe helps facilitate some of that similar process of lowering the response in the amygdala and activating the prefrontal cortex that's doing more processing. It's something to do that I can remember in the moment if I feel like I'm going to pop out of my skin or mm. something like that. So that that's why I love this. So this was originated by psychiatrist Dan Siegel, specifically in a book that he wrote about teenagers. And I figured if it's good enough for the teenage emotions, it's good enough for me. That's a <laughs> lot of chaotic emotions right there. Yes, right. yes. And this approach works in many different scenarios, whether you're journaling just for yourself, whether you're talking to a partner, or maybe if you're just having a moment of self-examination. So SIFT stands for Sensation, Image, Feeling, Thought. And so you just go through those four things. So first is sensation. What sensations are occurring in my body at this moment? And maybe that's throat tightening, heart beating, my muscles getting tense in a particular area or relaxing in a particular area. And then image, you know, what kind of imagery is running through my mind? And not everybody experiences visuals in their brain, but if you do, then taking note of them can really offer insight. So it could be a flashback to a particular memory, or it's an image of a weird imagined future, or it could be little snippets of sound or touch or familiar faces or... I suddenly got this flash of an image of my mom rolling her eyes at me when I was a child Mm -hmm. and everything that carries with it. And then you move on to feeling, just what feelings are inside you. And again, 
this can be difficult to separate from physical sensation like we talked about earlier in the episode, but it's getting curious about what sort of feeling tone that sensation has. So this fluttery feeling in my chest, is it excitement? Is it dread? Could it be anxiety? Could it be surprise? And So this maybe, is the word portion. Yeah, is, the word portion. This is where maybe you pull out your emotion wheel. Exactly. To try to, and then cross-reference with your okay. mood journal. Yes, correct. And see correct. what makes sense. <laughs> Great. <laughs> and then lastly, thought. So what thoughts are running through your head? And so that could be your own inner voice. It could be hearing somebody else's voice, generating explanations, rationalizations, making meaning, catastrophizing, laying down criticism of yourself or the other person. And I I just find it really helps to not only separate these things out, but then also I can see, oh gosh, that's so interesting that when I have this physical sensation of my chest tightening, then I also have this thought of, oh God, I'm worried that I'm going to die or whatever it is that's happening in that particular moment. I think this is a really good exercise just for generating more awareness of yourself. And it can be a good place to start as well. You know, either you can just write this out and have that information, or you could say this to a partner. You know, you could really break down and describe to your partner, okay, these are the physical sensations. This is the image that I have. This is my feeling. These are my thoughts. And it gives you just more prompts and more... I suppose more fertilizer for a conversation. I I'm having these vague memories right now of of Dedeker of you potentially sifting me. Oh yeah. While I've oh, been yeah. expressing that I didn't know what was going on and, oh, and yeah. these, I've sifted these you, steps are sounding sure. oh, familiar. <laughs> where you're like, what are you feeling physically? Like, what's the <laughs> sensation? And then kind of going through the image. You know what? You know what are you? What are you seeing? Is there something attached to this? Mm. And then what do you? feeling, you're trying to label it, which is what I was struggling with at first. And then kind of that thought of like, does it mean anything? Is there something you want to do with it? So I guess the lesson here is you can also use it when trying to support someone else through something. You can sift them. Yeah, you can sift them. And I think what I've learned from sifting Jace is <laughs> you also <laughs> just like see it. Jace is like a, a nugget of gold that you're yeah, like sifting you're, you're on little- the my little oh, flake see. of gold exactly. in my pan right. full of mud yeah. that I full of picked rock, out of the river. Full of rocks. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> sifting that through. <laughs> what I was going to say is what I've learned from sifting Jace is I think if you are going to use this on a partner, use these as questions to ask a partner. Also be open to the fact that not everybody experiences their feelings all in these same ways necessarily. And so for some people, when you ask them, what's your body sensation? They may be like, I, I don't know. Really, I don't know. You know, or if you ask them, what images do you have in your brain? They may say, I don't have any. And that's okay because we all experience emotions in many, many different ways. And so some people may have answers that they can readily access for all of these or only for one of these. Huh. So now I'm just curious. (laughs) So, because I feel like for me, physical sensation is very much a part of it for me, but imagery, not as much. Is that, does that track with your, scientific analysis of me in the past that I wasn't aware of. (laughs) Dedeker's putting her therapy hat on when she's talking (laughs) through this. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. I suppose that tracks. I suppose that tracks. Although, I don't know. I I feel like in the past, I've tended to be more curious about physical sensation because often that's what I get curious about the most with myself. And I haven't Mm. been as curious asking you about imagery. Is your experience that that you just tend to not get very much imagery when a feeling comes up or when a thought comes up? Yeah, I would say, well, I'm actually kind of curious about this, where I guess when when looking at this term image, if this maybe could be broadened to include other things, that's maybe more like talking about what's that voice in your head saying about it Hmm. or something like that. See, I would categorize that under thought. It's interesting because I guess I feel like the, like the thought is more like the conclusions I'm making from it or like more intentional versus I guess what I think of in that image category is more like these are the voices that are just going that I feel like are more out of my control, that they're just like part of the feeling hmm. versus kind of leading to a thought. Yeah, I don't know. I wonder which way they're they're thinking about having this go. Well, I mean, I don't think that this is necessarily <laughs> like an airtight empirically designed tool. I I think the point with all of these tools is just a starting point. 
Yeah. Right. Just something to grab onto when when you're not sure what your feelings are or you're struggling to put your feelings into words. So the last one, the last thing that we have to give you is like an actionable tool. And this is an interesting one. It's to maybe text it out as opposed to saying it out loud to maybe your partner if you're having mixed emotions or you don't know what the heck is going on or you're upset about something. Maybe just use a little text message instead. So this is the thing that we've all sort of been socialized to feel pretty shitty about like initiating a big or a heavy conversation over text. There's like nothing worse than getting a text message from your partner saying, we need to talk after work. When you get home, we need to talk and then not knowing what the heck is going to happen there. I But this, you know, isn't necessarily a bad thing in certain situations. So using text or an email for a heavy topic, it may make things exponentially easier. And there are studies on online text therapy, and they've suggested that there might be an online calming effect where participants are less emotionally aroused when communicating via text compared to -to face-to-face. This does need further research. It's debatable that sometimes feeling emotionally aroused during therapy could be a good thing in certain situations. So, yeah, hmm. it, 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 but it might be something to try out. That's interesting because I feel like I've also heard from some people and, and other studies on this that people are sometimes more able to express maybe controversial feelings over text than they are in person, which I could see, I could see that being helpful, like either in a therapeutic sense, like you were just talking about, or even with your partner, if you're trying to say something that you keep holding yourself back from that, I yeah, I could see an argument for that. And I do know people who employ this in their relationships who've just learned, this is what I have to do. So yes, I absolutely have done this in my relationship. Oh, really? oh yeah. Because I I have had moments where just both of us are not communicating clearly and effectively and it, it, it tends to heighten emotions to a point where it's just like not beneficial to continue talking about it in that moment. And we call a halt and then I'll go write, you know, a letter or an email or something and then send it to my partner because to me, sometimes I'm able to express myself much better via an email or via, you know, written word as opposed to verbal word, because especially, I mean, you just talked about this, Dedeker, much earlier in the episode, but I think that fear response comes into play in trying to convey emotions through verbiage and through words. And so when you're able to kind of shut that down and just do it via writing, I think that that can be really helpful in certain scenarios. So... I don't know. Text is is different because there's kind of this idea that you have to be uh, quick about it and getting to like sit down and read an email or write out an email and maybe take a little bit more time with it. I find that to be super beneficial and helpful in certain situations. Mm, Yeah, that's interesting to see the different medium, different media for sending a text based message can affect also how you feel about it and how you do it. Yeah. 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 I think I just encourage people to just be intentional about it. Even intentional if you're not sure if this will work for you, but you're open to trying it. You know, if you can intentionally express that to your partner, if the two of you can meta communicate about like, hey, let's try this thing, or hey, I know we have to cover this uncomfortable topic in our radar. What if we tried sitting in separate rooms and exchanging instant messages or emails or text or stuff like that and just see how that goes? And maybe we can agree on if it seems like it's going horribly, then we'll try something else. I do think that sometimes taking nonverbal communication out of it is sometimes helpful. If your partner is Mm. triggered by a look that you're giving or, you know, a subtle eye roll or uh, and, you know, maybe angry or sort of heightened, raised voice. All of those things can be cut out if you are at a computer writing something down. And, you know, it, on the flip side, that sometimes is difficult for people as well because, you know, that emotionality gets all those lost. Cues. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But I think if you're, if you find that you or your partner are getting very triggered by the nonverbal cues that you're giving off, especially when you're super heightened emotionally, 
then maybe this is a good, you know, alternative. So there are some tips from Emma Austin writing on Medium about this texting it out thing. So use emojis. And we actually talked about this in episode 335 on nonverbal communication, but there was a study where people were using emojis and, you know, using their little avatars in order to convey nonverbal cues and that that made people feel like, oh, yeah, they like me or they don't like me more. You know, it it, it allows for... yeah. Exactly. You're like adding back in some of those nonverbal cues yes. into a purely verbal medium. That's yes. interesting. Yeah. I know. I, I do like that, but maybe they are a little bit more benign because they're not like actually happening in real time on your face, perhaps. I don't know. Right. You can also pay attention to punctuation. So yeah, I mean yeah, exc- exclamation points, lots of, you know, full capitalization, things like that. I, I do want to add just a note about this that I think this is actually really important uh, is to take that time to pay attention to your punctuation, Mm. capitalizing letters, spelling things right. Because when we're, especially on our phones, right? Or if you're just bad at typing on a computer, right? It's easy to make like a lot of mistakes that can kind of make the communication worse. Or it's like, wait, you're What are you saying? what with your coffee? And it's like, you know, no, actually, I was trying to say my car or, you know, whatever other thing it was mm-hmm. that ended up there. Just I, I do want to stress that that is Take your time. Like, don't don't let the need for speed make you not look at these things. So I also think it gives you that moment to make sure you're communicating what you actually want to be communicating and not potentially making a situation worse unintentionally. Yeah, I'm also, you can do things like ask for clarification. I like this one because Again, especially if you if you feel as though you need to be speedy about it in a text conversation and you're not getting the whole message or getting it in perhaps the way that it was intended, asking for clarification is really beneficial in these moments. And then also you can write more than you think you need to. That's also going back to like writing the email out. For me, it just being able to sort of go through, okay, this is what I heard from you. This is what I meant. And can you clarify what it is that you meant in that moment and perhaps where I'm going wrong in my interpretation of what it is that you're saying? Things like that. Uh, and yeah, just write a little bit more if, if you, if you want to sort of drag it out a bit, but also, you know, <laughs> try to clarify as much as you possibly can. Right. Because again, you're missing all those nonverbal cues. Yeah. And so you might need to say a little more to clarify what it is you're trying to say and ask for clarification. Be like, wait, so when you say this, are you meaning that that you're angry about that? Or are you saying that to mean that's more like where you want to get to and you're upset that you're not there? You know, those sorts of questions of like, what do you really mean by this? Yeah, right. So just a quick recap of our four approaches. First is find an emotion wheel. Second is to do some mood journaling. Third is to sift it out. And four is to turn it into text. We hope that you enjoy experimenting with some of these and let us know which ones work the best for you. So stick around. We're going to be doing our bonus episode this week on emotional intelligence, which is a little bit related to this topic and specifically looking at some controversial opinions about whether emotional intelligence is actually a real thing. And on our Instagram stories this week, we're going to be asking, when do you struggle to put your feelings into words? So again, you can go to our Instagram, multiamory underscore podcast to answer that question. The best place to share your thoughts with other listeners on this episode is on this episode's discussion thread in our private Facebook group or Discord chat. You can get access to these groups and join our exclusive community by going to patreon.com slash multiamory. In addition, you can share with us publicly on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. Multi-Emory is created and produced by Jace Lindgren, Emily Matlack, and me, Dedeker Winston. Our episodes are edited by Mauricio Balvanera. Our social media wizard is Will McMillan. Our researcher for this episode is M. Mays. Our production assistants are Rachel Shenowark and Carson Collins. Our theme song is Forms I Know I Did by Josh and Anand from the Fractal Cave EP. The full transcript is available on this episode's page on multiamory.com. 